Okay, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our minds with the light of your truth. Fill our hearts with the fire of your love. Move us from where we are. Change us from who we are. Guide us to where you want us to be. And transform us into your own likeness. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, so today's recorded lecture is on Genesis chapters 4 through 11, which I have collectively entitled Humanity's Decline. We have a murder, a flood, and the building of a tower, which goes terribly wrong. So let's get to it. So in chapter 4, well first, before we get to chapter 4, sorry, we should take account of what it means for sin to enter the world. Stop and reflect upon the nature of sin for a couple slides here. So in Genesis 3, we encounter the root of sin. We have in the Garden of Eden these two trees, the tree of life, which just gets a brief mention. It's there in the Garden of Eden. And we're left with these questions about it. Were they allowed to eat from it? Well, presumably, yes, because they were allowed to eat from all the trees in the garden, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the other tree. But we might also wonder, did they eat from it? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, we have reason maybe to believe they did uh, because of what happens later. But the tree of life is a tree that concerns life. We don't really know much else about it, but it becomes a very important symbol, particularly for Christians. If they've already enjoyed its fruit, namely they are alive, and if death hasn't entered the world yet, we have yet more reason to think that perhaps they have already eaten from this tree. So this is a, a default tree, but I think more importantly, Genesis 3 places before Adam and Eve a choice. Do they eat from the trees that they are permitted to eat from, including the tree of life? Or do they transgress the instruction, the, the command of the Lord, and eat from the tree that is forbidden, namely the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? We, have, we should have questions about this tree too. Like, why is it bad? Why would the Lord create a tree, put it in the garden, put fruit on it, and then tell the newly made man and woman, don't eat the fruit from it? And if it has a name, a title already, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, why would the fruit from that tree be bad? Why is it bad to have knowledge of good and of evil? Is the knowledge of evil itself somehow evil? How could it be? Well, one way of looking at it maybe is that to know the difference between good and evil presumes that you have some experience of both the good and the non-good. You know the difference. You must have some encounter or inkling of evil in order to differentiate it from the good. So if they have not yet encountered any evil in the world, if they themselves have no evil at this point, then to know that difference between good and evil is really an introduction to evil. That's what it amounts to. So they were warned against its fruit. They were told if they eat of this tree, they would die. So this uh, contrast between the two trees becomes very stark. They are in fact opposites, contraries. They are the tree of life and ultimately the tree of death because if you eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then death comes. And so at the beginning of the Bible, this will be important, particularly as we get along into Exodus and Deuteronomy and throughout the rest of the Bible, God has placed before humanity a choice between life and death. So it's human beings' choice to eat from the tree of life or to eat from the tree of death. So the choice they make, of course, they are deceived by the snake who tells them they will be like gods, they want to be like gods, but there's an odd contradiction there. They were already like God, right? They were made in the image and likeness of God. And so to desire to become like God implies that they 
either were denying this fact about themselves or that they forgot it. So they were caught either in a denial or a forgetfulness of their own identity. They wanted to be like gods, but they forgot or rejected this part of themselves. They were already like God. But more than that, to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil means to determine for themselves what is good. They, in essence, want to be the source of their own life. In other words, they want to determine who they will be. They want to make the choice. They want to take the action that will define who they are. They, in essence, want to make themselves in the image of their own choosing. So they are undoing this aspect of creation in a way. They want to make their own identity, to make themselves in their own image. So in a sense, sin is a rejection of dependence because they're refusing to be dependent for their identity and for their life upon something other than themselves. And this maybe more uh, personally or more immediately is a denial of trust. They refuse to be dependent because they refuse to trust the one upon whom they would be dependent. And ultimately, I think you could characterize the sin in Eden as a refusal to relate to God rightly, namely as a creature, as a being that God has made. Adam and Eve want to create themselves. They want to be their own creators. They want to be the principle of their own existence. And so they're rejecting their identity as a, a creature, as something that's part of creation. Okay, so now what are the effects of this sin? Well, there are some initial manifestations of it. First, as we talked about before, there's shame, which is namely an embarrassment uh, at what one is, maybe just at a given moment, but uh, I wish I were not the way I am at this moment in this way. I wish I were different. And they embody shame because they have to cover themselves. They were naked without shame, but now they're ashamed. And so they cover their bodies. Also fear. I hope nobody finds out about me. They are hiding from God. They don't want to be found out. Which, think about it, has a kind of integral relationship to shame, right? I am embarrassed about who I am, and so I want to hide who I am. So nobody finds out. And then finally, blame. Once they're found out, uh, the problem can't be in oneself. It has to be outside of oneself. It's someone else's fault that I'm this way. And so this is when the antagonism begins, the conflict, the discord begins. Eve blames the snake. Um, Adam blames Eve. Everybody's blaming somebody else for what happened. Now, these initial manifestations eventually develop into more mature fruits of sin. I mentioned one already, discord. So you have Adam and Eve already opposing themselves to one another by blaming someone other than themselves. Of course, this leads to distrust. When you throw somebody else under the bus and blame them, usually they don't trust you as much anymore after that. And more long-term, it can lead to resentment. I can't believe they did that to me. And so you regard the other person always as the person who threw me under the bus. And it's a long-lasting sense of antagonism towards the other. This can easily develop into violence. So I really distrust that other person. I'm opposed to that other person. I'm resentful of that other person. Boy, I wish that person wasn't around. And maybe I'll lash out at them and get rid of them. There's anger involved, and anger, when it's expressed outwardly, becomes harm or injury. And we'll see how the sin of Eden eventually develops into this mature fruit of violence. And then finally, where does violence leave you? Well, if you distrust your friend, you're resentful at your friend, you lash out at them, you're angry, and you harm them, you harm them enough, they're gone. And so... At the very least, you want to get away from each other, and there's an ultimate uh, break, right? Uh, you can't really be in right relationship with them. Uh, again, there's this chasm, this uh, blockage or obstacle between you and them, and most of the time you just end up on your own, either because you killed them 
or because your relationship with them is so broken that you can't be around them anymore. And so this is the ultimate effect of sin, a kind of loneliness, uh, being on one's own, moving away from others, uh, moving away from an order that would unite you with the other. Okay, so now to Genesis 4, the story of Cain and Abel, the first brothers. And what a story it is. Cain, son of Adam and Eve, is the first child born into the world a tiller of the ground, so he's a farmer. He grows crops. Abel, his younger brother, is the first sibling to enter the world. Cain and Abel become siblings at the same time, but only with Abel's arrival. And Abel is a herder of flocks, so he's a shepherd. So they grow, they do their thing, and eventually they bring offerings to the Lord. And like the picture on the top left there, they place these offerings on an altar. And the way these ancient offerings work was if you place them on an altar and they catch fire, that means the Lord has approved of this offering. If they don't catch fire, then that means the Lord doesn't approve this offering. And so the Lord favors Abel's offering of one of his sheep. Cain's offering, not so much. And this makes Cain angry and dejected. So he's in a bad state. He's angry, right? He's gone from a state of uh, resentment to anger now. And where is this going to lead? Well, before Cain can act on his anger, the Lord has words with him. The Lord says, why do you feel this way? Which is interesting because the intervention first takes the form of, examine yourself, Cain. Think to yourself, why am I feeling this way? And just in general, as a psychological tactic, this is a, a, a really insightful one from the early parts of the Bible. You're caught up in an emotion. Take a step back and ask yourself, why am I feeling this way? So it, it's an invitation to reflection and then to self-direction. The Lord says, act rightly. If you do, your offering will be accepted. But if you don't, Sin lies in wait at the door. Its urge is for you, yet you can rule over it. Interesting distinction here between acting wrongly and sin. So if you don't act rightly, then sin lies in wait. That's interesting. Most Christians would tend to think, well, what is sin? It's acting wrongly, right? It's not acting rightly. But it's not quite the same connection. It's not the, identity. It's not the same thing here in this story. To act wrongly is the beginning of sin. Sin lies in wait, the opportunity of wrong action to take advantage of that. So I don't know what you make of that, but uh, Father Bartholomew has a little bit of an uh, interpretation of that. It's not even acting wrongly that's the sin. It's refusing to recognize, to turn away, to accept the wrong action. To be like, oh, no, no, it's, it's actually a right action. That's really where the sin is. But the Lord is saying to Cain here, you can rule over it. You have the power to right the ship. You have the power to turn and to act rightly, but you're on the wrong path right now. So turn around, switch paths. But Cain doesn't, sadly. He lures Abel out into the field and he kills him. Now it's interesting, we don't know what field it is. Is it Cain's field where he grows his crops? Or is it Abel's field? I think we have reason to believe it might be Cain's, the place where, where Cain was growing crops. Why? Well, we'll see in a second. So God comes looking for Abel and asks Cain, where is he? Where is Abel? And Cain replies, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? A classic line from the Old Testament there. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I responsible for my brother, for another human being? And God responds to him, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And so the Lord punishes Cain by saying, the ground will no longer yield its produce to you. It shall no longer give you its produce. So this is why I think this field where Cain led Abel into must be the field where he grows his crops, because it's that very ground from which his brother's blood cries out and the blood has kind of poisoned it. And so Cain can no longer be a stable, stationary farmer. He is banished. He is cursed 
to be a wanderer of the earth continually. You shall become a constant wanderer on the earth. So he's becoming a nomad, which is really a terrible punishment when you think about it. It's a punishment. He'll have no rest. He'll have no stationary, stable home. He will just be wandering from place to place, and no ground can be called his. So it's an intensification of Adam's curse, right? Uh, you'll have to toil and work really, really hard to get the earth to cooperate with you and help you grow food. But for Cain, that's completely out of the question now. The earth will not grow food for you at all, and so you're going to have to be a nomad, a wanderer. Cain has trouble with this. He says, I'll be killed. I mean, what will I do? I won't be safe. I won't be secure. And the Lord says, no, if anyone kills Cain, Cain shall be avenged. The Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one would kill him at sight. Now, what's interesting, is this a blessing or a curse? On the one hand, Cain will survive. He won't be killed. On the other hand, though, he will have to live out his whole life as a wanderer. And he'll have to remember what he did. And every time he wants to settle down until the ground, he'll have to remember the ground is tainted with his brother's blood. So Cain is, is left in a, a very bereft condition. Okay, so then the next story, chapter 5 through uh, 9, is the story of Noah and the flood. We have an account of intervening generations first, though. We have this guy named Lamech, who is the son of Adam and Eve, I believe. Um, no, Methusael. So he's the grandson of Adam and Eve, and he's the first person to take multiple wives. Now, this is very clear if you read in the context, a decline. It's, this is not a good thing. He takes more than one wife, and he's kind of a hothead. He is uh, boasting about how many wives he has, and he's boasting to them about how he will kill anybody at the slightest opportunity, even if they bruise me. I will kill a man. And if Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. So he's a man bent on violence and he's exploiting people. He's, um, you know, taking his wives for himself. Um, Adam only had one wife. So humanity's going in the wrong direction. But you do have some signs of hope. Enoch, who is the son of Adam and Eve, um, Oh, no, he's the son of Cain, actually. Cain became the founder of a city, which he named after his son, Enoch. Enoch walks with God. He talks about how Enoch has this relationship with God, which is kind of like Adam's original relationship with God. Remember, God walked with Adam in the garden. And so Enoch walks with God. And when Enoch dies at the end of his 365 years, he was no longer there, for God took him. So it even implies maybe he didn't die um, a normal death. The Lord then limits the human lifespan after these heavenly beings called the sons of God mate with human women and produce these demigods called the Nephilim. It gets a little weird, a little mythological. The Nephilim were the heroes of old, the men of renown. But you see humanity is becoming diluted in a sense. It's losing its place in creation. The role of the human being within the whole order of creation is becoming confused. And so the Lord says, well, I have to limit their lifespan to 120 years. So the next part is about how bad humanity gets. Humanity is utterly corrupt, both externally in their actions and internally in the thoughts of their heart. It's all gone bad. Only one person finds favor with the Lord now, and that is Noah. So Noah walks with God like Adam did before the fall, like Enoch did. He is righteous. He is blameless. And so God says to Noah one day, I want you to build an ark like this. And he specifies the ark and down to every detail. And so Noah does it. God also says to Noah, I will establish my covenant with you. This is really important. The first time in the Bible that this word covenant appears is with Noah. The covenant is a certain type of agreement. We'll talk about it more later. And the Hebrew word is berit. It's a special kind of agreement, binding agreement, all-encompassing agreement, an agreement that makes its partners family. So God's going to establish this binding familial agreement with Noah. 
And part of that plan involves a flood. God is going to send a flood to wipe out everyone else on the earth. And he tells Noah to fill your ark with pairs of animals of all kinds, seven pairs of all the clean animals so you can have something to eat. And Noah eventually obeys God, does all that he commands, loads up the ark. And then there are 40 days of torrential rain, 40 days of what you might call re decreation or anti-creation because remember what creation was, it was a limiting of the waters. So that second day where the waters separate from the waters and you have a space within the world for humanity to dwell, well, this is a reversal of that. The waters are coming back together again and, and threatening to overwhelm what God has created. It's the reverse of creation, creation in reverse. So the waters swell, but the ark floats. And so Noah, his family, and all these animals are saved. But everything on dry land with the breath of life in its nostrils died. I put that quote there just to sort of point you to the um, hearkening back, the echoing of Genesis 2. How does Adam become alive? Well, God breathes breath into his nostrils. So this breath of the nostrils is, a, is an image of life. Life is being snuffed out. God's own ruach, his own breath, his own spirit is being snuffed out of the earth, except for Noah. But then humanity begins again. You have here a creation reprise. So when the waters had swelled on the earth for 150 days, God remembers Noah. I wonder if God had just forgotten or what, but in any case, after 150 days of the earth being completely flooded, God makes a wind. Again, the same Hebrew word for breath and spirit, ruach. God makes a ruach sweep over the earth and the water begins to subside. So here you have creation again, the water, the, the breath, the wind over the waters. That's how everything got started in the first place. Remember the wind over the waters. That's what happens and creation begins again. So all the life returns to the land, Noah and all the animals get out of the boat. But before that, Noah sends out these birds, right? His little scouts, see my little moving dove there. He sends out a raven and then he sends out two doves um, and they, eventually don't come back. There's a sign of hope when the dove with the olive branch comes back because it means things are growing again. So eventually everybody disembarks and Noah makes a sacrifice on an altar to the Lord. And this is the beginning of the, the sealing of the Lord's covenant with Noah. So Noah offers a sacrifice on an altar and God makes a promise. He says, I will never destroy the world again. God then blesses Noah and says, be fruitful and multiply. He's given the same command as Adam. And he permits meat eating now. He says, you can have the animals to eat, but make sure that the meat with its lifeblood still in it, you don't eat. It's very interesting and uh, very important for our class later on to remember that. Meat with its lifeblood still in it, you shall not eat. So you have to drain the blood before you eat the meat. And then there's something about human blood mentioned there as well. I will demand an accounting for every human life. So if you shed the blood of a human being, your own blood will be shed. So those two things taken together amount to all blood belongs to me. The blood of Cain or the blood of Abel rather cried out to the ground. It belonged to God. The blood of the animals belongs to me, so you don't eat it. And don't shed the blood of your fellow human being because it belongs to me. All right, so God seals this covenant with Noah and makes a sign to commemorate it. I set my bow in the clouds, he says. And it's not only the rainbow as we know it, but it's a bow as in like a bow and arrow, a weapon. So by setting his bow in the clouds, he says, I'm putting down my weapon. I'm not going to be at war with the world anymore. And whenever it appears in the clouds, I will remember, says the Lord, that's covenant between me and the earth. So if the clouds start to gather and it starts to threaten floods again, I'll remember, okay, don't destroy the world. But then humanity experiences another kind of fall. You see, Noah is sort of a second Adam figure, right? All humanity comes from him. He's commanded to be fruitful and multiply. 
and he is tilling the soil, right? He's starting a garden. He's given the same sort of task as Adam was given. He's a man of the soil. And it says he's the first to plant a vineyard. So here we have another garden in play, a vineyard, and another troublesome tree. The vine, the grape plant, yields these grapes, which Noah makes into wine. He becomes inebriated, and he must have been quite hammered because he passes out in his tent. Not only that, but he passes out naked. So did not go well. Not a good uh, evening for Noah. But he's naked in his tent, and one of his sons, Ham, sees his father's nakedness and doesn't do anything about it. The other two are careful not to look at the father as he's naked, but cover, his, cover him up and then to carefully leave the tent. So it's interesting that we have lots of elements that were here in the Eden story. Shameful nakedness that came from consuming fruit wrongly, right? And then a moral differentiation between brothers, like Cain and Abel. So this should sound familiar to you. This is sort of a reprise of the Eden story. It's another kind of fall of humanity uh, in its second beginning. So humanity starts over, but it's still wounded. Noah's son Canaan, or his grandson rather, Canaan is cursed. This is the son of Ham. And he is told that he'll be a slave to his brothers. But the story of Noah ends with these words. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Just remember that. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Shem is his son, the son who helped him out when he was passed out in his tent and totally naked. Uh, so Shem is blessed. Okay, finally, chapter 11, the uh, Tower of Babel story. So here humanity is united. The whole world had the same language and the same words. And they develop a new technology which allows new possibilities for the human race. So the human beings of this city or this, uh, this gathering place in the east, they say, come, let us mold bricks and harden them with fire. So the brick is invented. And then they say, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. So notice the city builders here. Who's the first one to build a city? Cain, right? Cain establishes a city and names it after his son Enoch. And now you have the city builders building with bricks. And they not only want to build a city, but a city with a tower in the top of the sky. Now compare this with Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Then God said, let us make. This is when he makes the human beings, right? God is reflecting and saying, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to order the world. So the people of Babel are doing the same thing. They're saying, come, let us make this. Come, let us make that. They're putting themselves in the place of God. They're trying to make the world, which in a sense is the perennial sin, to claim the prerogatives and actions of the creator. But why do the people of Babel decide to do this? They give their reasons. They want to make this city with a tower in the top of the sky to make a name for themselves. And so make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered all over the earth. So the desire to make a name for themselves is connected with this fear of being scattered. Those are the two motivations for making this city and making this giant tower. But the Lord intervenes. The Lord says, oh boy, look at them. They're building this tower to the heavens. And if they do, nothing they presume to do will be out of their reach. So again, they're uh, overstepping the bounds of their power. They're taking and presuming for themselves a place in creation that they were not given. So the Lord says, come, let us go down and confuse their language. So the let us do this is met with the Lord saying, uh, let us do that. So the Lord scatters them from there all over the earth. So he confuses their language. They no longer understand each other. And this is the origin of all the different races, cultures, languages in the world. And that's why it is called Babel.
That is why it's called Babel. Chapter 11, verse 9 says, because there the Lord confused the speech of all the world. Just keep that in mind. We'll talk more about Babel lately. Kind of a nod toward uh, Babylon, uh, as we'll see. All right, what's the whole point of these stories taken together, chapters 4 through 11? Well, there's a pattern here. We want to be like gods. We want life, right? That's the original drama of Genesis 2 and Eden. That's why Eve takes the fruit. Instead of taking it from the tree of life, she takes it from the tree of knowledge of good and evil because she doesn't want the life God gives her. She wants the life of the gods, the, the ones who are immortal, the ones who are the principle of their own life, the ones who never die. But here's the thing. Here's the irony. We were already like God. And instead of getting life, we get death. Then in the Noah story, Noah wants to remake the earth. He plants a vineyard. He wants security. He wants a sense of well-being that comes from the drinking of the wine. But here's the irony. The earth was already remade. God already did that. And instead of getting security, he gets vulnerability. Instead of being uh, settled, he's passed out in his tent naked. Right? Nakedness in the ancient world was more of a sign of vulnerability than anything sexual. So he gets the opposite of what he wants. And then finally, the people of Babel want to make a name for themselves. They want unity, stability, all stay in one place. But what do they get instead? Division, dispersion, uh, confusion of the languages. Now, before we move on, just notice the pattern here. The people want what God has, in a sense, already given them, what they already have, but they don't want it like that. They don't want it as something they've received. They want it as something that they take for themselves. They want it on their own terms. And in trying to do that, they get exactly the opposite of what they want. In fact, they get the thing that they fear. And in some cases, the thing that motivated them to act in the first place. Fear, you know, fear is at the heart of sin. And it leads to getting exactly the opposite of what we really desire. So what about the name? So they want to make a name for themselves, these people of Babel. How does that get reversed? Well, this is really at the heart of what follows in the Bible, especially in Genesis. So who gives us our name is really the question. Where does our identity come from? Who are we? Notice that Adam is the only creature in the world that God names directly. God names him Adam, dusty, because he's from the dust. But then it's Adam's job to name everything else. It's the human prerogative to name everything in the world, but we are the only ones that have to accept the name given to us by someone other than us. But this is, in a sense, what Eve and Adam go on to refuse. They don't want the name they're given. They want to name themselves. Notice that names confer identity. And the drama of the Bible is that the human being struggles to learn how to receive their name, to receive who they are and accept it. So let's go back to that last verse in the story of Noah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Now, Shem, as I think I, I put in the last slide, is the Hebrew word for name. That's just what it means in Hebrew. Shem means name. If you translated the English word name into Hebrew, it would be Shem. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, the God of the name. The people of Babel wanted to make a Shem for themselves, but the God of the name is the one who will come and give humanity their name. And so the first verse after, this, after humanity is scattered at Babel, these are the descendants of Shem. These are the descendants of the name. Very interesting coincidence there. At the center of the drama, you might even say the fulcrum of this whole story is about the name. Is it the name we make for ourselves, or is it the name that God gives us and makes for us? Well, this, this question gets answered with the story of Abraham. So from Shem, eventually comes a descendant named Abram. And the Lord himself will rename Abram, and he will promise Abram to make his name, his Shem, great. So it's exactly what the people of Babel wanted, that God will give to Abraham, but not on Abraham's terms, 
on God's own terms. So Abraham is the one who receives and accepts the name that God gives him, and it is this name that God will make great. And it's in this way that God will give what the human person really desires, an identity, a home, life. Okay, so that's it for today. We'll see you guys uh, when we meet next.